My name is Jeremy Swist. Thank you for tuning into my presentation, Romanticized and to a great extent Utterly Wrong Images, The Impact of Cinematic Antiquity on Heavy Metal Music. So I'll start by discussing metal's reception of antiquity. Uh, there is currently in the catalog of metal songs written since the 1970s, thousands of songs on a broad array of topics in antiquity, from history, history to mythology to literature to philosophy, with the majority of these songs focused on ancient Greece, Rome, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. Uh, there have been hundreds of bands worldwide that have written at least one song on these topics, but there are plenty of bands that have produced whole concept albums, uh, and as well as a handful of bands like Ex Deo, that are devoted exclusively uh, to topics like ancient Roman history. And in the past 10 years, there's been a growing body of scholarship in both academic journal articles, book chapters, and whole edited volumes uh, by classicists and Egyptologists and medievalists and others uh, who have looked critically and tried to explain the phenomenon of uh, the reception of antiquity and heavy metal by the likes of Osman Umerhan, Leira Olivaria, uh, Elena gonzalez Vacariso, Christian Thudirschlev, uh, and myself. So let's look at what some of them have to say in order to explain why heavy metal uh, sees such an appeal in various topics from the ancient world. Osman Umerhan in Selecta Classica says that metal's appropriation of Greek and Roman antiquity in terms of aggression, struggle for power, and masculinity speaks predominantly to a youth culture that uses the medium of metal as a platform for its general angst and feelings of alienation from contemporary society and thereby seeks to mark its own place in society. Moreover, in the first edition of the journal Metal Music Studies, uh, Christian Thujerslev uh, argues that the Alexander figure, a, a very common uh, and popular figure in heavy metal's classical reception, created by heavy metal narratives has much in common with Achilles today as in antiquity, and they are popular paradigms and models for the idealized masculine figure of the heroic past. The bands are also attracted to the Alexander figure because of the special resonance that he has with community and unity. These themes claim the attention of all the bands in various ways and through powerful concepts such as universality and nationalism. In other words, Alexander not only is the ideal, powerful, masculine individual okay, to emulate, okay, but he's also a common cultural touchstone, uh, as well as uh, a national hero of various bands uh, in Greece. Finally, the Spanish classicist uh, Elena González Vacariso uh, sums up the appeal of ancient Rome specifically uh, to uh, heavy metal bands uh, in four dimensions here masculinity, escapism, empowerment, and nationalism, all colored by a dimension of romanticism for an idealized past uh, in rejection of the status quo. Finally, we should look a little further back at uh, the genesis of metal studies scholarship in the early 90s by the founding mother of metal studies, Dina Weinstein. And uh, you'll see that uh, her explanation of what the uh, core themes of heavy metal are uh, requires uh, a look at uh, Greek mythology and religion in order to explain it. Okay? She says that the major themes of heavy metal fall into two clusters defined by a binary opposition, Dionysian and chaotic. Dionysian experience celebrates the vital forces of life through various forms of ecstasy. It is embodied in the unholy trinity of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The Dionysian is juxtaposed to a strong emotional involvement in all that challenges the order and hegemony of everyday life, that is, chaos. Monsters, the underworld, and hell that are grotesque and horrifying, disasters, mayhem, carnage, injustice, death, and rebellion. And though this was written in the early 90s, uh, this idea of these uh, two uh, gods, essentially being the gods of heavy metal, uh, has, uh, has been maintained as the genre has continued to develop. The classicist Chris Fletcher uh, has studied specifically bands uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, in the former limits of the Roman Empire and ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, uh, who have used heavy metal not only to channel uh, their masculine aggression and their uh, feelings of rebellion, but also ways of tapping into their ancient heritage as a form of this rebellion, okay? uh, looking at ancient Egypt, Greece, uh, and uh, Rome uh, as places where the uh, masculine values of heavy metal are celebrated 
And also this is where your authentic identity is in an implicit rejection of the Christian or Islamic uh, establishment uh, in which these bands uh, grew up. And we also see certainly hyper-masculine figures in the Pharaoh here or in Poseidon here, okay? And also notions of power and violence and chaos uh, in all of these, right? And Mediterranean metal was not the first to do this. Uh, before Mediterranean metal really came to the fore, uh, bands since the late 80s and early 90s uh, in places like uh, Scandinavia uh, have looked at uh, Viking history and Norse mythology for similar inspiration, uh, where they find uh, figures that are uh, ideals of masculinity, uh, rebellious figures, and also figures that uh, uh, to them represent their true pagan pre-Christian heritage uh, in an implicit uh, rejection of the Christianized status quo as represented by this album cover here with the destruction of the Christian cross. But we also see here on this album cover on the left, uh, we see this idealized masculine figure uh, wearing a very unhistorically accurate uh, Viking helmet with the horns. Okay, and that is definitely not what Vikings wore. However, this is a band from Sweden that very well may have known that this is not how Vikings would have looked. So what explains that? Uh, was it pure ignorance uh, or was this deliberate? And there is evidence to suggest that this phenomenon is deliberate. If we look at the genesis of Viking metal itself with the Swedish band Bathory. Uh, so the lead person in the band Bathory was a man named Corthon. And uh, Bathory originally wrote, uh, in the mid 80s, uh, wrote songs that had more of the stock themes of rebellion uh, and aggression and individualism and heavy metal, that is satanic and anti-Christian themes. Uh, but he saw that the transition to singing about his own national heritage and about Vikings and uh, paganism uh, also uh, was a way of channeling those instincts. He said that that Satan in hell soup uh, type of soup was changed for proud and strong Nordsmen, shiny blades of broadswords, dragon ships, and a party till you puke type of living up there in the great halls. An image of my ancestors, my Swedish ancestors, and that era not too far from the romanticized and to a great extent utterly wrong image most people have of that period in time through countless Hollywood productions. In other words, Quarthon here, uh, saw in the Hollywood and pop culture version of Vikingdom uh, an image that was more appealing to the core themes of heavy metal. Uh, and so he ran with those uh, in writing his songs, uh, despite knowing to the contrary uh, that these were not historically accurate depictions. And indeed, uh, we should acknowledge the debt that heavy metal has to popular culture and especially cinematic popular culture uh, since the beginning. Uh, one of the uh, first heavy metal bands is the British band Black Sabbath, uh, which put out its first album in 1970, Black Sabbath, uh, and the, the band took its name directly from the 1963 Boris Karloff horror film, Black Sabbath, because the likes of Tony Iommi, Jeezer Butler, and Ozzy Osbourne were trying to create uh, a genre of rock and roll that uh, was essentially the musical equivalent of a horror film, exploring uh, the darker themes that were had not really been previously explored in rock and roll music up to that point. And that trend certainly continued into the 70s and into the 80s uh, with uh, Black Sabbath's countryman Angel Witch, uh, who formed in 1978 and released their debut album, self-titled, in 1980. Okay? And you can see that uh, a lot of their songs have to deal with themes of the occult, of witches, of dangerous women, as well as things like Atlantis. So they have a several uh, instances of appealing to themes of antiquity, uh, but they also have a song called Gorgon, and let's talk about that. Uh, the song Gorgon by Angel Witch uh, is essentially uh, a heavy metal adaptation of the film The Gorgon, 
which came out in 1964 and stars Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee and Barbara Shelley. And the Gorgon uh, is inspired, of course, by the uh, Medusa myth. Uh, but the premise of the film is essentially that uh, the spirit of one of Medusa's sisters named Megara in this film uh, had survived into the modern day where it took possession of a woman named uh, Carla. Uh, who uh, essentially turned people into stone uh, during all the times that she was possessed by this spirit. Uh, and at the end of the film, she's essentially uh, ambushed by her lover, uh, Paul, uh, who didn't realize that she was the Gorgon. Uh, and she was decapitated by Christopher Lee's character. Spoilers. Uh, and the Angel Wicks song uh, essentially retells more or less that film uh, especially the scene where she is decapitated by Christopher Lee. Um, but we'll notice that in the film, uh, sorry, that in the song, uh, the band uh, kind of reorients this view of uh, the Gorgon as someone who is deliberately deceiving the male protagonist, okay? a female that brings doom, don't let her deceive you. Okay? Uh, and the idea that this is almost an allegory, uh, this film, almost an allegory for a relationship uh, in which the woman uh, is deliberately uh, feigning her love for you, uh, and that the only way to get out of this relationship is through violent means. Eh? And so this uh, theme of uh, Medusa as the archetypal femme fatale uh, becomes very popular in heavy metal uh, from this point, perhaps best uh, represented in the Adanthrax song Medusa uh, that came out a few years later. Uh, the next film I'll focus on also has to do with Medusa a bit more directly, uh, and that's the film Clash of the Titans, which came out a year after Angel Witch's album uh, in 1981. Okay, so this is uh, one of the most popular uh, retellings of the Perseus and Medusa myth. Uh, which also introduces uh, Pegasus uh, from the Bellerophon myth uh, as Perseus's uh, form of transportation both to and from Medusa's lair. Uh, I will focus on the concept album uh, Dark Gorgon Rising by the Cypriot uh, power metal band Astronomicon. Uh, and one thing I'd like to stress is that album artwork uh, is essentially what helps really sell an album. Uh, this is the first thing that consumers of heavy metal encounter. And this is essentially the image that uh, people associate with this music. And so in order to appeal to uh, a familiar cultural touchstone in 2013, Astronomicon uh, represented Medusa as she was represented by Ray Harryhausen uh, in Clash of the Titans on the left there as this very un- uh, Gorgon-like from the ancient world, serpentine monster okay, with green skin. And you can see that she is similarly represented on the album cover. However, we also see that she is far more sexualized uh, than in Harryhausen's original, again, uh, appealing to metal's uh, themes of hyper-sexualization of both male heroes and uh, uh, feminine heroines and antagonists such as Medusa. And we see this even more so in other receptions of Medusa in metal, such as that by the Argentine uh, power metal band Axe Battler, uh, who in their debut album represent Medusa also in a both serpentine and sexualized manner to be contrasted with the hyper-masculine uh, Perseus uh, in the album cover, who looks very much like uh, Conan the Barbarian or the members of the band Manowar, uh, as these sort of barbarian, uh, hyper-masculine figures. However, despite using the Harryhausen Medusa in order to appeal to a wide audience, the lyrics of this album uh, betray a very comprehensive reading of the primary sources for the Medusa myth, not only the literary sources, but also material culture. Okay, so in the title track, we see references to Medusa uh, as a formerly beautiful maiden okay, who was transformed into a Gorgon by, by Athena okay, after she was raped by Poseidon. 
Okay, and this account comes from Ovid mainly. But uh, the band also demonstrates that they read sources such as Hesiod and Pseudo Apollodorus describing the gorgons with serpent scales, bronze, hand, bronze hands, and golden wings. Uh, but also, we see evidence that the band is familiar with uh, the famous uh, vase by the Gorgon painter from the Archaic period, which shows Perseus running away from Medusa's sisters. Uh, after he had decapitated Medusa here. Also, we saw from the album cover that uh, Pegasus was introduced, much like he was in Clash of the Titans, and the song Bloodborne uh, is, shows a familiarity with the uh, ancient source Genesis of Pegasus as coming out of the uh, decapitated neck of Medusa. Um, but here, uh, in addition to that happening, Perseus sees... Uh, Pegasus as a convenient way of escaping from Medusa's sisters. So we have a very interesting combination of the film and the primary sources in this album. The next film I want to look at uh, briefly uh, is the film Quo Vadis, which among other things uh, has one of the most famous uh, and influential representations of the Emperor Nero. Uh, and I'll look at the, band, at the song Nero by the Swiss thrash metal band Messiah. Uh, who in 1987 put out a song called Nero, uh, which largely focused on Nero's uh, deliberate uh, setting fire to Rome uh, and singing while Rome burns. And this song celebrates Nero okay, as uh, a uh, someone who embodies madness and embodies uh, kind of antipathy to the status quo that his singing out of key while Rome burns, as he does in the film, okay, uh, corresponds to how heavy metal music uh, uses sonic transgression as well as transgression in its subject matter. Okay? Uh, and uh, also, as in the film, uh, this song celebrates Nero, who as not only kind of a, a nihilist who, uh, in a poetic way, uh, uh, burns down Rome uh, as part of his sort of poetic project, but he even blames the Christians for it uh, at the same time, even though he takes credit uh, for burning it. Uh, and we see in the uh, dialogue to Quo Vadis from the 1950s uh, that uh, why this particular Nero appeals to uh, a band like Messiah, because the Nero in that film also is represented as mad, but also is representative as uh, ambitious to do something uh, that is worth remembering, whether it is good or evil. Eh? And that uh, transgression, if you will, is a work of art uh, that will immortalize his fame. Uh, the last film I want to look at is 300. And uh, this is a film that uh, is certainly familiar for its representation and misrepresentation of the ancient Spartans and the ancient Persians uh, and uh, its appeals to various uh, fascist uh, representations uh, of, of these civilizations. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, classicists and others have been doing a lot of damage control uh, as a result of this film, which came out in 2007. Uh, and that certainly includes um, its influence on heavy metal. Um, certainly in album artwork, where we see uh, bands uh, uh, taking the comic book representations of the Spartans directly, uh, as well as lyrics uh, directly from the film. Okay? In fact, we can quantify this. Um, Sparta, in general, is one of the most popular uh, themes in heavy metal music's reception of the ancient world. And we can see the correlation uh, between the number of songs on Sparta that came out uh, and uh, various uh, events, such as uh, the premiere of 300 uh, in 2007, uh, when the number of songs spiked. But we can also see here uh, there is correlation with various other things, such as the release of the sequel, uh, as well as certain events like the 9-11 attacks and 7-7 bombings uh, that may very well have uh, influenced uh, some bands uh, looking at Sparta and this clash of civilizations between East and West, represented by the film, including uh, a band called Sons of Liberty from Nashville, Indiana. Uh, 
And the thing about Sons of Liberty is that this is a side project of John Schaefer, who is better known as the uh, guitarist and lead songwriter of the very popular American heavy metal band Iced Earth. Uh, and John Schaefer uh, took part in the 2021 January 6th uh, Capital insurrection. He was uh, arrested uh, and he uh, pled guilty, and he's facing uh, several years in prison. Uh, Sons of Liberty is a band that largely uh, sings about right wing conspiracy theories, uh, and its 2011 album, um, Sign of the Times, uh, has a song called Molan Labe, which is a very common uh, rallying cry of. Um, libertarians. And we can see in this representation of the Battle of Thermopylae in the song Moral and Larvae, uh, direct quotations of the film 300. Okay, onward we march to the mouth of hell, tell your king these men are three are free, eyes as black as night, describing the immortals, the wall of Persian dead. Okay, these are uh, elements from the film that uh, were either directly quoted from the dialogue or were elements that were uh, manufactured by the film, such as the Wall of Persian Dead, is not uh, a part of the battle as described by Herodotus and other ancient sources. Okay. So to sum up, uh, we see uh, some of the implications and the reasons for heavy metal's uh, reception of antiquity as influenced by Hollywood. Okay. And kind of the three main takeaways here for why this matters is that first off, heavy metal music ly lyrics and imagery have been and will continue to be heavily inspired by cinema as it has since the very beginning. Next, metal artists incorporate the versions of antiquity presented by popular films into their art, either out of ignorance or deliberately, because these depictions are familiar cultural touchstones that also resonate with the heavy metal ethos. Finally, metal lyrics cover art in music videos, and thus the film-inspired versions of antiquity therein are consumed by millions worldwide. Okay. In other words, the way that Hollywood and uh, portrays uh, the ancient world uh, has an impact beyond just uh, what people see on the screen, uh, but this also influences uh, musicians of one of the most popular genres of music in the world today and the consumers of that music are also consuming those representations of antiquity for better or worse. Thank you.